Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the Dorset series. A county with a border on the English Channel, Dorset is a pretty part of the country with towns and villages to match. Here's one of them for your viewing pleasure. Hello folks, welcome for the first time to Dorset. And the first foray into the Dorsetian landscape sees me at the top of a hill. And this is a hill that most people in this country know thanks to a very famous advert. Here is said hill. There you go, I'm sure you've all seen that view at some point before. It appeared in a very famous bread advert and I've just walked up it and trust me, it's as steep as it looks. <laughs> Welcome to Shaftesbury. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Shaftesbury, Point Fort. Hello out there Dorset, for the first time TVI has set foot into your county and of all the places to pick from, almost 300 of them, I've probably started this journey with one of Dorset's most famous towns. This is Shaftesbury, founded by King Alfred the Great in the late 9th century when he built a network of fortified towns across his kingdom. He did this in the event of a Danish attack and if one occurred, all the men in the area would gather in the burr or fort to fight them. Shaftesbury was one such burr. It was a natural place for one because it lies on a very steep hill overlooking the Blackmore Vale. In fact, it's the only significant town in Dorset to command such a position atop a hill, and how. It's some 215 metres above sea level. The ruins of Shaftesbury Abbey can be found on top of these steep slopes. It was one of the richest religious establishments in the country before being destroyed at the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539. Shaftesbury's lofty perch has earned it some fame. It's a well-known place to many people across the UK and beyond thanks to the steep cobbled street that climbs the hill adjacent to the Abbey ruins. That would be Gold Hill, which will forever now be associated with bread thanks to the work of Sir Ridley Scott. Let's go and walk up it. Buckle up folks, there's a lot of landmarks in this one. We start our walk on St James's Street at a pub called Ye Olde Two Brewers. We're going to see a lot of pubs on this route, but this was by far my favourite. Built during the 18th century, Ye Olde Two Brewers is a traditional quaint inn renowned for real ale and home cooked food. It's nestled in the heart of what could be termed a suburb called St James. This quietly affluent area was once bustling with successful businesses such as tanneries and laundries taking advantage of an abundant water supply from a nearby pump house. If you follow the street to the east, you will come to what has been described by many as the most famous street in Britain. It's got a few competitors, but Gold Hill is certainly one of the frontrunners. This steep cobbled street with buildings that look like they belong in a bygone age is widely known for being the setting for the most famous advert we've ever had on British television. Often called the boy on the bike, the advert features a young lad delivering bread to a house atop this very hill before freewheeling back down it again. It was directed by Sir Ridley Scott 
and it was for Hovis. Thanks to the advert, a lot of people call this Hovis Hill. The street runs beside buttressed walls of the precinct, which are the grounds surrounding the ancient Shaftesbury Abbey built by King Alfred the Great. The walls are scheduled monuments, and their origins are not known. They are presumed, at least, to have been built in the 1360s, when the abbess of Shaftesbury or some other senior authority figure was given royal permission to build the town's defences. Every year, the town hosts the Gold Hill Fair to raise money for local charities. The Gold Hill Gallery can be found at the summit. This used to be the Black Lion Cottage and it's Grade 2 listed. Also up here there's the Gold Hill Museum that now houses a shop. Looking down from the top has been described in the past as one of the most romantic sights in England. If you're brave enough to scale its steep gradient, have yourself a breather at this, the Hovis Loaf, which is outside the gallery. I can confirm, even in the rain, that Gold Hill and its view from the top are as lovely as they look in that Hovis advert. And this is that famous advert, dating from 1973, which made Shaftesbury synonymous with Hovis bread. Last stop on round would be on my Peggotty's place. Twas like taking bread to the top of the world. Twas a grand ride back though. I knew Baker at Afghetlon and doorsteps of Otto is ready. There's wheat germ in that loaf, he'd say. Get it inside your boy, and you'll be going up that hill as fast as you come down. When I think of Gold Hill, more often than not, it's this that comes to mind. Five years later, the advert was parodied by the much-loved comedy duo The Two Ronnies. Filmed in the same location, this was their hilarious take on Sir Ridley Scott's work. The delivery boy is now a much older man, still delivering to the top of the hill, only this time, there's no bike. Back to the route, and at the top of Gold Hill is a blue plaque which marks the site of the former Guild Hall. That was pulled down in order to widen the high street and to make way for the town hall. That narrow alley brings us into the main town square, which has a raft of shops and businesses to explore, as well as many interesting landmarks. However, we'll get a look at all of that in a moment, because first we need to head towards the other thing that Shaftesbury is famed for. That would be the ruins of Shaftesbury Abbey, which sit atop the hill that we've just climbed. Shaftesbury Abbey was founded in 888 AD and was dissolved in 1539 by King Henry VIII. At the time, it was the second wealthiest in England. It was a convent and it was founded for women only. King Alfred named his daughter, Ethel Giffu, as the first abbess of Shaftesbury. Elle Giffu, the wife of Alfred's grandson, King Edmund I, was buried at Shaftesbury and was later venerated as a saint. As such, it's her who is often regarded as the true founder of the house. Between April and October, you can explore its ruins, because it's now a museum. The abbey was absolutely enormous. You can see from these sketchings how big the place would have been. It was too rich a prize for Thomas Cromwell to pass up on behalf of King Henry VIII. 
In fact, there's even a saying coined by Bishop Thomas Fuller at the dissolution, which goes, if the Abbess of Shaftesbury and the Abbot of Glastonbury Abbey had been able to wed, their son would have been richer than the King of England. I reckon that's true. Now, opposite the Abbey ruins is usually a really good panoramic view over the park, but today the rain had other ideas. Now, of course, in the summertime, that view will be absolutely perfect. I'm afraid, though, at this time of year, that's the best you're going to get. It's going to be drab and dreary all day. Despite that, we are going to be passing back through the park later towards the end of the route. So that view may have improved by the time I get to, to get, get to that point. We've still got a lot to cover in between times. Now, if we turn around at this point, we have a big column which greets us here. I believe this is a war memorial, so we'll talk about this next. Indeed, it is a war memorial. Known as the Park Walk War Memorial, this is a large stone cross with Celtic knotwork and winged angel carvings on its head and shaft. Its design was inspired by the Saxon cross we saw in Eam in the Derbyshire Dales. There are 76 names on this one from both of the World Wars. Via Abbey Walk, we're off towards a church, passing by the rear of the Westminster Memorial Hospital in the process. This was constructed in the mid-19th century with a legacy from the wife of the Duke of Westminster. It's been greatly modernised since then. Now this church is in fact a former church. It was made redundant in 1977 and the congregation was transferred to St Peter's. The Trinity Centre Trust acquired the building in 1980 and now it's leased as a day centre, a scout headquarters, workshops and offices. It's still a prominent building though. Holy Trinity is located just 200 feet north of the Abbey ruins and it has a spacious churchyard with some pollarded trees. The church was founded sometime before 1615 with aisles, a porch and a west tower. It was then completely rebuilt on the same site in 1841 by Sir George Gilbert Scott. Now let's head into the town centre, properly this time. Through the centuries, Shaftesbury was small but busy. In the late 17th century and during most of the 18th, the main industry here was making buttons. This though died out in the 19th century. There was also a malting industry and there were many breweries here at one time. The brewing history is still evident here because as we'll see, there are loads of pubs. It remained a small market town through the 19th century as the railways passed it by. Had they come, it would have greatly boosted the population. Towering over the centre of town is the magnificent Grosvenor Arms. This started life as the new inn, first appearing on maps of Shaftesbury in 1553. By 1700 it had been renamed the Red Lion, at a point when the town had no fewer than 27 inns and alehouses. Much of the current building dates from 1820, after the innkeeper was refused a new lease by the landlord, Earl Grosvenor. He invested heavily in the town as part of a wider political campaign to gain control of votes through acquiring land and buildings. He redeveloped the pub, renaming it in the process the Grosvenor Arms. Around onto Bell Street now, here's a lovely old building. In a town with so many thatched houses, a fire was a serious problem. Standing empty currently, this is the old Victorian fire station, which was staffed by a captain, a lieutenant and 12 men. Before wartime, the engine was in fact a horse-drawn hand pump. The horses that used to pull it were kept in a field in Enmore Green, and time was unavoidably wasted as efforts were made to catch the horses and harness them to the pump. The modern fire station is located out of town. Bell Street has a few shops, but the largest is this Morrison store. This used to be a Summerfields and Budgeons. Despite being a franchise, Morrison's took a more local approach when they opened this store by offering a range of specialist products sourced and produced locally alongside its usual items. Over the road we have the Gallery. Between 2007 and 2013, this used to be a charity shop until it was converted into a space to house the Gallery, which was originally inside the Shaftesbury Arts Centre next door. This arrangement continues to this day. 
The Arts Centre can trace its roots back to 1949, when a permanent organisation was needed to encourage people to take part in the cultural life of the town. This is now a hub of activity, with music and drama groups, dance and art classes, and a burgeoning film society. Further up the road we have the Bell Street United Church. This is a local ecumenical partnership, created in 2001 between the Methodist and United Reformed Churches. Rebuilt in 1827, it stands on the site of a former Methodist chapel, which in turn stood where St Lawrence's Church once was previously. Speaking of former properties, next we go through Swan's Yard, named after a coaching inn that once stood here. It was a place full of activity, where travellers stopped on their journeys and where locals met to exchange news and views. Swan's Yard today is known as the creative heart of Shaftesbury, specialising in unique artisan shops. It features the Signet Gallery, which offers local artists a space to exhibit their work. As well as this, the Swans Trust was set up in 1997 to promote and develop community facilities and projects across the town. So after walking through Swans Yard, you're back to the main street where we were a few moments ago. You can see over there the top of Gold Hill and the beginning of Abbey Walk. You walk down to the Abbey down there. Now you can see here there's some interesting buildings. This tall one here is perhaps the most important in Shaftesbury's town centre. Let's head towards that and see what it's all about. That tall building is St Peter's Church, the oldest in Shaftesbury. It was built at the top of Gold Hill as a pilgrim's church outside the walls of the Abbey. It has some evidence of an earlier building in the form of ancient foundations under the nave floor. In the 19th century, Holy Trinity was used as the parish church because St Peter's fell into serious disrepair. During World War II, the South Isle was even used as a grain store. In 1971 the church was declared redundant, but this was reversed three years later, and once again St Peter's became the main church for the town. Next door, and currently undergoing some renovation, we have the Town Hall. This is another Grade 2 listed building, which was commissioned by Earl Grosvenor. It was built between 1826 and 1837. The clock is by Gillett and Bland, and it strikes the hours using a single bell. Inside there are four murals painted by Phyllis Wolfe in 1979. One of them depicts the consecration of Shaftesbury Abbey in 888 AD. The principal room is the council chamber on the first floor, and the basement once contained a number of police cells, which were accessed from the rear of the building. An about turn brings us to a pub. Grade 2 listed since 1973, this is the Mitre Inn. It was rebuilt in 1933 after the original, dating from 1825, was knocked down. A section of the building, though, can trace its history back to 1615. It stands at the highest point in the town and offers some amazing views to the rear. Now, Shaftesbury is full of gift shops and independent retailers. Heading down the high street, the Dorset store is a good example. It has charity shops aplenty, too. Again, for example, we have the Naomi House and Jack's Place Hospice Shop, one of many across the region. Now we're in Angel Square and you're looking at the post office. This stands on the site of the former Angel Inn, which was the home of the town's first postmaster in the 1660s. Early post offices were often within an inn because they could easily accommodate horses and carts that delivered the mail. Now we bear right and we're on Salisbury Street. This follows the southeastern edge of the high ground, gently sloping into the valley below the town. If followed, it becomes Salisbury Road and passes Shaftesbury School and ends at the Royal Chase Roundabout on the A30. If you keep walking down Salisbury Street, you'll come to a Roman Catholic church dedicated to St Edward the Martyr. Slowly completed, this church features statues depicting several saints, including St Edward himself. His bones were interred in a tomb in Shaftesbury Abbey after being transferred from Wareham. Legend has it that en route to Shaftesbury, a miracle took place. Two crippled men were restored to full health after standing close to St Edward's bier. These events meant Shaftesbury became a place of pilgrimage as people travelled from afar in search of similar miracles.
Okay, so it's just gone eight o'clock now, which means I've been going for an hour. And to be fair, I've covered quite a lot in this hour. This next hour is important though, because apparently the rain is gonna come down heavy at nine o'clock. So I'm gonna try and get around this next bit as quick as possible. To be fair, there's not a great deal of landmarks in this next part. The next thing we're looking at here is right there behind that tree. Those railings belong to Shaftesbury Town Football Club. That's next. I do love finding a non-league football ground. Shaftesbury Football Club are members of the Wessex League, and they have been since 2004. They were established in 1888, and the club's first success was winning a League Cup in 1900. In the 1905 and 06 season, they were champions of their league. Their most successful period came in the 1940s and 50s, when they won 12 cup competitions in the span of a decade. They moved away from their original ground in 1974, relocating here. This ground is known as Cockrums or the Cockrums Recreation Ground to give it its full title. Behind the football ground is a sports bar which is connected to the club and it's one of the venues used for the annual Shaftesbury Fringe Festival. Behind that is the Shaftesbury and District branch of the Royal British Legion who meet here in the Legion Hall at 10am every Thursday. This area is all open plan, and as such you can walk from Coppice Street through a series of car parks to Shaftesbury's Tesco and Little Supermarkets. These are located right next to each other. When Tesco was built, Shaftesbury Football Club had to relocate their pitch slightly to make way. Now normally we wouldn't dwell too much on a supermarket, but Tesco has some historical secrets you wouldn't even know were here. When Shaftesbury Abbey was in full swing, it owned vast swathes of land around it, including land which was extensively farmed. A medieval farm, owned by the Abbess of Shaftesbury, was established on a site which is now occupied by Tesco's car park. Of course, there's no above-ground evidence, but if anyone ever digs up the car park, there's no telling what they might find. Remember, King Richard III was found under a car park in Leicester. After passing the post office again, we're now on Angel Lane, which gets its name thanks to it. At the other end of this street are lots of cottages, which all have a theme. They all mention things to do with bread or baking. The bakery in question was Anstey's in Angel Square, which used to bake around the clock and often provided welcome hot snacks for late night revellers. Perhaps too on the bready theme, although I can't confirm this, is our next landmark. This here is an old granary, which has been turned into a block of flats. It could have also been used for brewing. Next door is Shaftesbury Lido. This is an outdoor swimming pool and it's one of the oldest in the country. It dates back to the mid 19th century when Shaftesbury Waterworks was built. The town's first swimming club was formed in 1891 when the Lido was known as the Tank. A bit further up the road is the boarding house for Shaftesbury School on Salisbury Road. The school is one of only 39 state boarding schools in the country, whose origins go back to 1718, when it was founded as the Blue Coat School. This boarding house underwent a £3 million refurbishment in 2012. Next we have the modern fire station on the A350. This road bypasses the town to its eastern side and technically forms part of the A30 at this point as well. The fire station was officially opened in June 1976, but there are no horse-drawn engines in this one. Heading north, we pass the Longmead Industrial Estate next, which has among its many features a veterinary centre and the local Royal Mail delivery office. This road ends at a major roundabout, but before I hit that, I opted to swing left into the Barton Recreation Ground, away from the noise and bustle of the road. This park, along with much of the area we've just walked through since Tesco, historically formed part of the Manor of Barton, which belonged to Shaftesbury Abbey during the medieval period. It now forms what's known as a fringe belt, distinguished by extensive recreation and commercial facilities. In the park, you'll find the base of the Shaftesbury Town Silver Band. It was founded in 1869 and was originally known as the Penny Whistle Band, due to the fact that it consisted mostly of whistle pipes. It later became a fife and drum band. 
Next, it's Bleak Street and Haynes Lane. Although Shaftesbury is famous for Gold Hill, it's not really a hilly place and this street is the, the first hill I've actually had to walk up since Gold Hill. So that tells you how much of a, a flat plain the main town lies on. We've got a couple more landmarks to see in the town centre, so by walking down here we'll catch those and then we'll turn around and head for Bimport where we head towards a castle. At the end of Hames Lane you're on Bell Street once again. This time we're outside the library. Now I should have turned left here because in the other direction is the Retreat, the site of the original Blue Coat School founded by William Lush. It has a blue plaque on the side of it. Anyway, we continue along Bell Street for the final time before we make a right turn back towards Bleak Street at the Bell Street United Church. The only other things of note in this area, aside from yet more quaint terraced houses, are a handful of shops and the Bell Street dental practice. This next section is all about pubs. This here is La Fleur de Lis on Bleak Street, which is officially a restaurant with rooms. Originally when opened this was on Salisbury Street, but since 2003 it's occupied what used to be the old Sunridge Hotel. Before that this was a girls boarding school. Next door is the Shaston Social Club. Now Shaston is a name you might hear if you visit Shaftesbury. They are one and the same thing. Some of the locals refer to Shaftesbury as Shaston. The town has had other names in the past too, including Care Palador and the gorgeous sounding Sophonia. Here's another pub. The King's Arms dates from 1720 and it was purpose built as a coaching inn on the main route from London to the southwest. It underwent a large scale rebuild in the 19th century when it was owned by the Earl of Shaftesbury. Across the way we have the Ship, which is Grade 2 listed. This is a 17th century building which was converted into a pub in 1937 after the original Ship Hotel was demolished. A counter in the main bar here has a panelled front and shutters which are believed to work, but nobody dares lower them in case they get stuck. There are some pubs that Shaftesbury has lost. Here's one. This used to be the Rose and Crown, but before that it was a house lived in by Lord Arundel. The property has been rebuilt since then, dating as it does from 1835, but it's believed some parts of the old house, built in 1590, are incorporated into it. Now we're on Bimport. That building there is Savoy Court, which occupies the site of the former Savoy Cinema, which opened in 1933 and could seat 380 people. Bimport is also the location of a Quaker meeting house and a former maternity hospital, which is now Castle Hill House. Next we have Ox House, grade 2 listed and believed to date from the late 16th century. It was once owned by John Grove, a Shaftesbury benefactor. This one has some literary connections. Ox House featured as Old Grove Place in Thomas Hardy's novel Jude the Obscure. Just beyond Ox House is a path that leads to Castle Green, a wide open expanse of recreational space located at the summit of another steep slope. This time we're looking north into Wiltshire. This view ordinarily would be as impressive as the other panorama near the Abbey. Again, the weather didn't help. Something people don't realise when they come to Shaftesbury is just how many of these vistas there actually are. Gold Hill usually gets all the attention, but most people don't realise that Shaftesbury is one of the highest points in England and thus commands excellent views in all directions. On a clear day from here you can see King Alfred's Tower on the horizon on the Stourhead Estate. And if you carry on walking you end up at Castle Hill, which is also known locally as Boltbury. There's no castle standing here these days, but there is a distinctive castle mound. I'm pretty sure I've been getting some strange looks as I've been walking around because I've got my, my boots on this morning, my Wellington boots. And the reason is all to do with this because this bit is definitely not the easiest bit to traverse in trainers, especially when it's raining. <laughs> so here is the castle mound. There we go. I'm not going to climb to the top of it. You can see there is a, a muddy, slippery path to the top of it, but there's the mound anyway. I don't want to risk falling down that, even in boots. We can walk all the way around it and it will take us back to Bimport. 
The castle was built during the First English Civil War between 1135 and 1154 by supporters of King Stephen and Queen Maud. It was what's known as an adulterine castle or fortified house, which historians believe was likely made of both timber and masonry. Medieval fortified houses like these were residences belonging to some of the richer and more powerful members of society. Its position was upon a small promontory at the western edge of the hill on which the old town was built. There are no stone remains, but most of the site is a scheduled ancient monument. Back on Bimport, next we have the oldest house in Shaftesbury, Edwardstow, which is the only medieval building that survives in the town. It can't be dated accurately, but one thing is for sure, it definitely predates the dissolution of the Abbey. It was built in what is thought to have been originally the Saxon Burr. Edwardstow literally means Edward's place, and is of course a reference to Edward the Martyr, who we discussed earlier. After this, we continue along Bimport back towards where we left it from castles and medieval houses, next we're talking healthcare. Here we have the ambulance station, which is ideally sited because just around the corner on Magdalen Lane is the front entrance to the Westminster Memorial Hospital. In 1871, some two years after the death of Richard Grosvenor, the second Marquess of Westminster, his wife Lady Elizabeth Leveson Gower and one of their daughters gave a plot of land for the construction of a hospital in her husband's memory. This is it. It's opened in 1874 and provides about 20 inpatient beds, a minor injuries department, a range of outpatient clinics and other support services. Via the hills we're back to St James, and here we have the church, dedicated to the same saint. The original church, simply designed, was thought to have been built in around 1138. A tower was added in 1660, in which there was a clock and three bells, including one from the 14th century, dedicated to St James, and believed to have been cast here in Shaftesbury. It was rebuilt in 1725, just 30 yards away from its original site. The Marquis of Westminster, whose family owned much of Shaftesbury, donated £2,000 for its rebuild and various other notables made up the difference. Close by we have a school, the Abbey C of E. This school first opened as St James's School in 1873, and although extensively modernised it still retains its two original Victorian classrooms. In 1987, following an amalgamation with Enmore Green School, it was renamed the Abbey and then it changed from a first to a primary school in September 2003. After the school, it's just a simple case of following St James's Street back to Ye Olde Two Brewers. The narrow terraced road with some beautiful buildings sits under the park at the foot of Gold Hill. Our last major landmark is halfway down the street. This is the Rolt Millennium Green, which was brought to life as part of the Millennium Celebrations in the year 2000. Together, a team of local volunteers helped to design and develop this beautiful shared space in the heart of St James. The green is recognised by the Dorset Wildlife Trust as a wildlife-friendly garden. There's a parish notice board in here, so let's tick Shaftesbury off the list. And nearby was an advert for Alfred FM, Shaftesbury's local radio station, which yours truly was featured on right after finishing this walk. Andy Smith has gathered quite a following for his online videos, documenting his challenge set during the pandemic to visit almost 10,500 parishes across England. There are 48 counties in this country, and he has only 15 left to visit. For months, he's been planning a trip to Shaftesbury. Sadly, today's visit coincided with some of the murkiest and wettest weather conditions we've had in weeks. I caught up with Andy earlier this morning as he sat in his car outside the old two brewers, having finished his marathon early morning filming session around the town. I started by walking up Cold Hill because the idea was to 
to sort of go up to park, uh, walk where the Abbey is and have a look at the view. But I couldn't really see a lot, quite frankly. It was just misty and horrible and murky. And it was the same when I got to Castle Hill later. Well, sadly, because of the weather, we won't see stunning views from Castle Hill on Andy's YouTube channel, The Village Idiot, but he'll give our town a great write-up. It's a lovely place. It's, it's, it seems very, very narrow and clustered. Um, so in most of the streets, you sort of walk down them, you haven't got a lot of room, and there's not a lot of footpaths on, on either side. Um, I mean, there was a couple of occasions where I, I was walking down a, down a road and I had to sort of stand into the side because there was a car coming past. You don't normally get that. <laughs> Some of the places up north. So it'll be around, what, a 30-minute piece when finished? It should be. Uh, I've got something something like 250 shots of it, <laughs> which is, every shot is 10 seconds long. So, I mean, I, I can't do the maths offhand, it's too early in the morning, but, uh, but once I've cut a few bits out, it should be around 30 minutes, yeah. You must be soaked. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little bit wet. I've, I've, I've put a, a clean shirt on, um, and I'm halfway through changing the rest of me. Um, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did get a bit wet. It's all part. It's, it's all part of the fun. Well, I'm sorry you've had such a damp experience, but uh, we look forward to the video going online. Out of all the things you saw, with all the murk and the mist and uh, the mizzle around Shaftesbury, what <laughs> what impressed you the most? What do you think? Oh, that's quite nice. Um, I just I, yeah, I've got I've got quite a penchant for uh, for thatched buildings. I don't know why. We don't have many up north. Um, and uh, every time I see a thatched cottage, I just think, wow, that's amazing. And, I mean, St. James Street, where I'm sat now, I can see a couple um, through my misty, murky window. Um, and I'm just thinking to myself, they just look beautiful, they look gorgeous. I mean, they're all around the town. I mean, obviously, not just here on St. James Street, there's a couple on Gold Hill, obviously, and the, a few up in the uphill section, some along Bimport. I just love thatch buildings. Um, so I think they've, they've impressed me the most. Well, I'm sorry you've had a bit of a damp experience, but, you know, Britain and the weather, you can't do much about it, but... We look forward to seeing what you produce <laughs> online and thank you for coming to Shaftesbury and uh, spreading some images of the town. You've got a lot to work through, it seems. And if all that is anything to go by, I'm going to enjoy greatly my journey through Dorset. If you're a new viewer, keep in mind it's mostly villages I visit, so they won't all be as long or as detailed as this nor will they all involve a famous advert or two. As Ronnie Barker said, it was a bloody long way to go, but boy, it was worth it. Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as The Village Idiot, and I'm out.